Okay, hello and welcome back to episode 83 of the Market Maker podcast, where I'm joined by Piers Curran, co-founder and head of trading. And we're going to talk about some of the major things that have happened in markets this week. And it's been a pretty incredible week. And so to give you a quick flavor of what we're going to discuss for the next, well, I'm not going to commit to a time frame, but for the period ahead... <laughs> The Bank of England, they hiked rates by 0.5%, taking the benchmark rate now to 2.25%. That's the highest since 2008. But the pound fell, which is slightly a contradiction to normal economic theory. So we'll discuss why that happened. The Fed, the US Central Bank, they hiked rates. They went for another 75 basis point move higher. And actually, that might have been a relief to some, which normally would have meant that stocks went up because there was a partial market pricing of a of a hundred basis point rate hike, which did not materialize. But stocks actually sold off and quite aggressively so and are still selling off. In fact, going into the final trading day of the week and peers before you call me out, we'll get to that in a moment in regards to my year end call because Goldman Sachs have come out with an update and perhaps we can briefly touch on that when we talk about the Fed as well. Uh, and then two other big stories from the week. Japan has finally intervened in the currency. Uh, I know Piers and I have talked about this for a while, but we'll just quickly cover that as well. It's the first official intervention from Japan since 1998. And then a big story in the banking space. You might have seen the FT reporting the Credit Suisse is considering splitting its investment bank into essentially three parts looking to pivot away from traditional investment banking and focus more on wealth management but can their new management team pull that off what is their strategy so they're the things we'll discuss before i begin though we did do a bit of a call to arms for our ratings of the pod and so uh, just a quick one be amazing if you could uh, rate the show if you enjoy the episode or if you're a regular listener would super appreciate that um, we saw the Spotify ratings go from 256 up to 276 uh, okay. in the last week. So good effort, but we need to hit that 300 marker and you could be that person to get us there. So um, <laughs> help us out. Uh, and just to make it a bit interesting, um, the Apple voters are a, a lot more uh, complacent, complacent voters. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whereas the Spotify voters seem very motivated to get out there. So um, come on, Apple guys, let's, 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 let's uh, keep, keep the pace. But um, yeah, please do um, drop us a rating. It, it would be, goes a long way to help get this out to a lot of people. So let's kick things off then and talk about, about the Fed. So they've hiked interest rates by 75 basis points for the third consecutive meeting. Some might have thought, at least they didn't go for 100. Um, and that would have normally meant that stocks would go up in a kind of relief type reaction. But the opposite happened. And there was additional information, of course, which accompanied this particular meeting, because it was one of those uh, quarterly ones. So March, June, SEPDEC, when they released their economic forecasts. And perhaps, Pierce, you could take us through those and, and why... And what was the the trigger then that's weighed on U.S. equities? Yeah, definitely an important sort of uh, week for sure. An important moment in the week was obviously that Fed meeting Wednesday night. I, I guess there's a simple way to kind of explain what happened, and then which we'll start with, and then we can kind of drill into the the kind of finer detail. But the simple fact of the matter is basically Powell in the press conference uh, again has kind of shifted his sort of um, outlook let's say if you go back earlier in the year I mean obviously they've been raising rates all year inflation staying high and they're continuing to raise rates okay fine but the messaging about I guess the potential impact these higher rates might have has changed so I think back earlier in the year, Powell was of the opinion that, look, we're going to have to raise rates here, um, but it doesn't mean we're going to have a recession. He was basically saying we could probably avoid a recession. Okay. Then in the summer, he kind of shifted to going, well, 
we're probably going to have a recession, but he was kind of talking about a soft landing. So look, we've got, we got to raise rates faster. You know, this inflation thing's a bit more of a problem than we thought. So we're probably going to have a recession, but don't worry, it's going to be a mild one. And I think now he's really shifted again to, <laughs> we're going to have to raise rates for, you know, faster, for longer, they'll be higher. And you know what? And, and actually, here's the quote. He said, we have got to get, this is a direct quote from Wednesday night, we have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there was a painless way to do it. There isn't. Basically translates to, look, we're probably on for a hard landing now. So I think that that that's the kind of takeaway from Wednesday night, that the recessionary impact of this rate hiking cycle is now going to be worse. So, um, so with these projections then, so that's like the, that's a great summary of, of, the, of the situation. So let's delve into some of the numbers then and yeah. just to, to have a look at a couple. So for context then, in these quarterly projections, they will tell us market participants about things like their forecasting over things like inflation, jobs, growth, and the big one, which is where they see interest rates. So officials coalesced around expectations of unemployment rate to rise to 4.4%. They previously, well, the current rate is 3.7%. They expect GDP to slow to 0.2% for 2022, rising slightly in the following years to a longer term rate of 1.8. But the big one that traders will look at is immediately to the, the dot plot matrix yeah. on interest rates. So again, just to recap, this is where we will get a visual chart with literally dots on it which if you weren't educated about what that was you'd be a bit like hmm, what on the, what the heck is that but essentially um without knowing who specifically but we can have pretty educated guesses by the general stances of each fed officials uh, kind of communication on policy it plots them and where they see interest rates at the end of this year and each subsequent year thereafter and every quarter, we're able to map over what the shape of interest rates looks like connecting the median dot plots. So what was the shift in the dot plots then this time? Yeah, around? right. And so this is that finer detail as to really what drove the big market reactions that we saw. And yeah, I mean, as you said, to put even more simply, the dot plot is really the Fed's method of forward guidance. It's just them telling us what they themselves think interest rate changes will look like in the future. And, and, and this is where we've seen the big shift and we've seen massive shifts in this dot plot. And as you said, right, uh, uh, plot your dot for the end of each year. And I think it's the 2022, end of 2022 dot plot and, and really now into 2023. Um, so it's the front end of this dot plot curve that's key. And it's the front end of the curve that's massively gone up throughout the whole year. And it's stepped higher again. So just for context, in well, if you went back, let, 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 let's make this really dramatic. If you go back 12 months, okay, so go back to the September 2021 dot plot matrix. So on, on that matrix, they had the forecast for interest rates at the end of 2022, right? So back then, a year ago, the Fed themselves were predicting that interest rates at the end of 2022 would be zero. It's transparent. Right? No change, no rate hikes at all. Um, obviously, that was spectacularly wrong. So I guess that does uh, maybe, in one sense, dilute the hmm. sort of relevance, importance, accuracy of this. I mean, you would have thought, but it still plays a massive role in, in influencing market pricing. But so if we skip on, right? So in December, 2021, they were telling us rates at the end of this year would be 1%. Okay, so in three months, they took their end of 2022 rate forecast from zero to 1%, which is, was a big jump, right? March, 2022, their forecast moved up to 2%. So now, again, another 1% jump in, in year-end forecasting in June. Right. So this, I presumably, this is where the leap comes because right. February invasion of Ukraine. 
Exactly. So in June, they told us that year-end rates would be at three and a half percent. Right. That was a 1.5% jump on the on the previous. And then last this week, um, their year-end prediction went from three and a half percent to four and a half percent, essentially. Right. It's basically between four and four and a half percent. Okay. So yet again, year-end rate forecasts have jumped like a lot. And, and we're now up to this kind of four to four and a half percent range. Also, the 2023 dot mm. also jumped from three and a half up to what's now basically between four and a half and five. So right. that's, yeah. And the, 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 the big thing there, that was the one that immediately stood out to me, was that people are thinking the recession's coming, they're going to quickly start cutting rates. But yeah. that we're talking about these projections are where are interest rates at the end of the year yeah so in 2023 they actually see rates higher than when they see them ending in 2022 and that was critical correct and really the summer rally in stocks was based on the idea that the fed would start to slow down their rate hiking mm. and we were thinking you know maybe september they might hike 50 maybe november maybe they'll do 25 or 50 they won't be hiking at all in december and then when we get into next year they'll start cutting that was the thought in the summer that drove the stock market rally uh, obviously that's now wrong um the fed aren't slowing down their rate hikes uh so the forecasting then because we still got two meetings to go this year right and currently based off the dot plot that's another 75 hike in november and another 75 hike in December, maybe 50 to 75 in December, right? So, and then we're actually forecasting another hike in February now. So we're hiking into next year and then not expecting rate cuts at all now. So it's, it's an incredibly, you know, again, it's been the direction of travel here where we keep sort of adjusting um, we keep hawkishly adjusting our Fed expectations. It's been the absolute pattern mm. for the last 12 months. We thought we were going to stop having to hawkishly adjust, um, but sadly, that's not the case. So Goldman's came out with a note last night, and as you described, that's the pattern of interest rate hikes that they see. They actually see the peak of funds rate between four and a half to 4.75 percent so that's broadly in line with that terminal rate of 4.6 in the, the feds forecast the interesting part here is that goldman's now have cut their year end target i'm setting myself up here for a bit of a brutal bashing from peers but goldman's have slashed their year end target for the s p to 3600 oh. from 4300 but wait they base that on higher rates weighing on valuations. But the kicker, which you'll particularly enjoy, is that Goldman said the risk to the latest forecasts are skewed to the downside because of the rising odds of recession, a scenario that would reduce corporate earnings, widen the gap and push the US equity benchmark to a trough of 3,150. Sort of right, okay, that's their like outside bear, most bearish case scenario. Yeah, but their base case is thirty six. Base, base case thirty six, uh, bearish scenario thirty one fifty. No, no one's interested in Goldman's. All right, they were at four. I mean, what their end of year forecast was forty three hundred. Now they're going. Oops, sorry guys, got that wrong. Oops. Yeah, yeah, that's a no, no one. Yeah, I stick to my guns. No that's one cares about Goldman's. What people <laughs> really want to know about is the Anthony Chung <laughs> year-end forecast. Because you, I think you're at 40, 4,600. Is that right? Well, yeah. You look. I, I, I don't want to fall into this camp that you just said, <laughs> where um, you know, there's a, it's being stubborn or or keeping my, <laughs> my credibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, on the chart, there's obviously, as, as uh, many of our listeners will know, there's a big level, which is the summer low in June, which was that initial no. trough before the summer rally that we had, where we went from basically 36.50 all the way up to north of 4,300. Yeah. 
um, you know, so Piers wasn't so confident when we were smashing through 4K and heading to 4,300 at the time. So yeah, let's see. Because I remember the stat that we said before about we've never broken down further from a bearish move. Uh, I think it was a stat we covered in a couple of other podcasts a while ago. This would be unprecedented if that happened. The odds, well, are, rising. On, that's the odds, not... are, odds are rising against me at this point. <laughs> that's that's not right well are you suggesting that the it would be unprecedented for the market to break the summer low and go lower in terms of not in history but going back to the date that i believe was what the second world war right so well it's happening it's gonna happen <laughs> summer lows it's, so that, uh, that, that 3600 though if you go back on the chart it's a key yeah. inflection point of for price sure. from a support in february 21 yeah. uh, to a high during the kind of the rally back from the covid dip in late 2020 big level and if we break that then massive yeah that would be huge you get a quick rundown pretty quick snap to 34 which was the pre-covid high and then there's a double bottom and another key level comes in at 3,200 uh, below. Yeah. So yeah. That, so we're trading 37, the low there. We're about 100 points now in the S&P away from testing that key level. So yeah. next week, it's make yeah. or break for me. Well, you know what's... Well, just so <laughs> just to bring the listeners up to speed because, um, you know, the best, the best kind of lead indicator... Well, the best indicator for market sentiment, like globally, <laughs> let, let me reveal it to this is a this is a high value big reveal here. The best indicator is Anthony Chung's holiday schedule. So whenever he goes on holiday, markets just collapse and tank. Uh, sentiment just <laughs> gets destroyed. You know when he's going on holiday, listeners? Next week. So I just hope that the fallout is so severe that the Fed go full board pivot to we'll do whatever it takes. And then we just Well, here's it. here's the problem with that, right? Because whilst whilst maybe in the past that was the case, right? Yeah. The Fed were perhaps kind of held hostage by the stock market. Mm. And whenever they're going, look, we need to raise rates and the stock market would sell off, they go, Oh God, all right, fine, we won't. Not anymore, right? Powell's in this mode where he's really, he now believes, rightly or wrongly, and time will tell, but he and his team believe that the only way to get inflation down is to actually um, uh, reduce demand, right? So one way, the conventional way is to raise interest rates cost of borrowing is higher, people borrow less, they, they spend less. So that, that kind of dampens demand and price pressures kind of drop, all right? But he thinks he needs to go further and he needs to drive the unemployment rate up. They, they, they believe they've got to create a recession. Hmm. They have to. They have to drive the unemployment rate up, people losing their jobs, then they're going to stop spending. So that that's... They, that's how aggressively they're thinking here about how to, to, to overcome this inflation problem. Raising rates isn't enough. They have right, to drive that recession, destroy that's, demand. That's the, the, the downside scenario that Goldman's talk about, about the further um, impact that it would have on corporate valuations through the fallout of their earnings, essentially. Yeah. Cool. Well, look, let's let's uh, let's pivot away from the Fed and let's talk about the Bank of England, because I know you're a big fan. And the Bank <laughs> of England have hiked interest rates for the seventh increase in a row. They've actually been hiking at every meeting since December. It's hard to kind of remember. Yeah, that they were the they, they were the first of the kind of developed economies to start hiking. So so rates now are the highest since the uh, the infamous 2008. And a couple of things before we delve into the, the key part, which was the, the Bank of England came out and they also um, lowered their forecast for peak inflation from what was, I think it was 13.3% originally. They're now looking at less than 11. 
and suggested a deep recession might be averted because of some of the actions taken since Liz Trust, a new PM, has come in, particularly around this energy relief plan. But the biggest talking point, undoubtedly, is... I don't want to, again, dramatize it, but the utter chaos sure. <laughs> going on in inside the building on Threadneedle Street, which is where the Bank of England is located, because the vote split was quite radical. Um, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when they were debating this one out. But well, you were, at, you were outside the building. I mean, it's just around the corner from our, our office. So you, you were outside, you walked up and were outside. Could you actually hear them like screaming and shouting, and shouting and arguing? Yeah, yeah. Could hear glass glasses smashing. Could hear everything, but five five of them voted for a fifty basis point uh, increase, so they got their way. Three though voted for seventy five. Yeah, um, arguing that incoming fiscal support will also add to demand, so it kind of feeds through on what you've just explained with the U.S. and what the Fed are trying to kind of counteract in that sense with higher unemployment. But then one. I'm probably going to say her name incorrectly, so I apologize up front, but Swati Dingra voting in her first meeting. She, I believe, was a professor at LSE in London. This is her first meeting. She was the lone voice. So <laughs> you've got a, you know, got admiration for her yeah, um, confidence in that sense. First meeting, stepping up to the plate, and she went, no, nope, you're all wrong. <laughs> basically um she wanted a 0.25 percent increase she cited concerns that activity was weakening and the risk of second round inflation effects are falling was her general thesis for her yeah. rationale but yeah your take um my take is i'm in her camp i just wish she'd gone a little bit more like and voted for no change if I, I think I think if I was on the committee and and look, I will never in my life ever be invited to join the committee. That's too many too many skeletons but, in your closet. But if I was, I would have voted unchanged. Mm. I think yeah, the the Fed, the US is a whole different ball game to to the UK. So the Fed hiking, you know, fine, I, I get it. Maybe that's right and justified. I think the UK, I think we've got trouble coming and. I think we need to stop hiking like now. Um, but so I, I wish she'd have gone just a, been a little bit more braver, but she was super brave. And yeah, as you say, stepping out and being that lone wolf is, is takes a lot. So um, I, I put out a comment on LinkedIn after this saying that in my 20 years in markets, I'd never seen the Monetary Policy Committee of nine people have three different uh, interest rate actions. So they vote, nine of them, as you're saying. I, I, I thought I'd never seen it where there's three different outcomes from the nine. Um, but I got corrected. Mm. Someone messaged back going, no, you're wrong. It has happened mm -hmm. in the last 20 years. Uh, and it was in 2011. So they and there they voted unchanged, but you had um, a couple of people voting for a twenty-five hike, and then Andrew Sentence voting for a fifty. Oh, I remember he was the Uber Uber Hawk, wasn't he? That's right. Um, so it has happened in my lifetime. Obviously, I forgot about that. But anyway, it's super, super, super unusual. Um, and look, you could argue that the whole point of a committee. I mean, really. You should you should be forming the committee with the objective of having different opinions, right? There's no point having a committee where everyone just thinks the same. You know, the whole point is right. What are the opposing opinions, and let's kind of argue it out, and, and let's decide. So, um, I think you should always have a spread of, you know, th this idea that unanimous, which the ECB love to roll out, is yeah. like Lagarde's favorite word. We're unanimous. Well, I don't want, I don't want you to be unanimous. That, there's probably some political overlay though on the unity yeah. of the eurozone and all the rest of it, for wow. sure. But look, I, I think, I think it's a reflection of just that. So this time they had, yeah, 
One saying 25 basis points, most going 50, a few going 75. The point is, it's so difficult. The, the outlook is so uncertain. It's an incredibly difficult moment in time. And right, you're getting a, a more of a spread of, of opinion and, and that kind of makes sense. Um, but it's a reflection of really, no one really knows. I think they, they're just, they're in the dark here. They're, they're literally in the dark. And they're just doing it because everyone else is. I mean, they were brave and they hiked first. I, I think they should be brave and stop hiking first. And, and, I, and I just wish. Well, maybe they'll do it next meeting, but mm. that, that's my view. And so the UK mini budget, as it's mm, being yes. labeled, has just come out. Is there anything yeah. in there that people should be aware of that might impact the bigger picture well you can, there's a whole load of stuff but you can bet your bottom dollar what the big headlines will be um and that's that they've chopped the higher rate of income tax they've removed it so the 45 percent band um which is on uh when does that kick in about is it above a hundred thousand I thought 45 was 150. It was 150,000, right, fine. So the bans are, it's, 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 it's no income tax up to 12,500. Mm -hmm. Then between 12,500 and 40 odd is 20%. And they're actually lowering that band from 20% to 19%. That kicks in April next year. Then above 40 odd grand, it's 40%. And then above 150 grand, it's 45%. They've scrapped that top one, which is obviously going to get the headlines because everyone's going to be up in arms about, oh, it's just a budget for the rich. The rich are just going to get richer. You know, it's just not fair, blah, blah, blah. That'll be, in, in, that'll in be the big In addition to scrapping bankers' bonus caps. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, here you go, bankers. You can have your <laughs> massive bonuses back. And oh, well, we won't tax it as much either. Um, press are going to have a field day uh, with this. Um, but look, this is a massive, massive budget. I mean, they're calling it a mini budget. It's the biggest budget I've seen, like for years and years. This is properly pivoting, like a massive pivot in, in policy towards um, big tax cuts across the piece and, you know, reducing regulation and unashamedly going out there with a big, aggressive, bold, very risky move of how do we sort out our big issues? Well, let's try and do it through big tax cuts, which we think will drive growth. They want to grow. They want to grow us out of this problem. Um, and look, there are big issues with the UK. I was reading a piece in the FT earlier this week, which was a really good one, and raising the, the issue around um, our current account deficit, um, which is right now a record ever. It's the it's we've got the biggest current account deficit ever in our history, going back to when data on this kind of stuff started to be measured. So really, it's back to 1955. We right now have the biggest current account deficit we've had ever on record going back to 1955. So this is a big issue. And it kind of ties into, I think, the problems we have here in the UK. And so just super quickly, what's a current account deficit? Well, it's just looking at the basically think about your current account and right money coming in and money going out. Right. So your money coming in, if you're working, right, that's your salary coming in. And then obviously what you're spending. OK, and if you've got a deficit, that means you just there's more money going out each month than is coming in. And obviously that's not sustainable. Um, you have to close that gap. And how do you close the gap? Well, it could be through borrowing money or it could be through international investment coming in to the country. Hmm. So what's happened? The big widening of the deficit has primarily been driven by the sharp increase in gas prices because of the Russia invasion of Ukraine and because the UK import a load of gas and we're very we're more dependent on gas than other European nations for our energy. And so this is this is the main reason. But underlying all of that is really a slow kind of trend over the last couple of decades, where the UK has just become less and less and less and less competitive 
less attractive as a as an investment destination. And so, you know, we're sat here with this monster deficit. And the government right now, I think they I think it's part of their plan here is looking at this deficit and going, geez, we we need to we need to do something about it. I, I actually, you know, this this budget. Yes, it's controversial. Yes, they are going to get slammed in the press. Personally, I think this is brave and I, I support it just because we need to shake things up. You know, we can't just keep on chugging along because we're going in the wrong direction. So I think it's bold and it's a big change. And I, and I, and I, I like it. Whether it will work, sure, it's risky for sure. But they're trying to attract in more foreign investment. I mean, the pound is super cheap. Um, so that should definitely help, right? Um, so, yeah, we'll see. But they're going to get slammed in the press for this. Yeah, just having a look on the chart, actually, Sterling has just weakened again just in the last few moments. Actually, while you were talking, you've just <laughs> knocked the pound lower again by... Uh... <laughs> A full point, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it just broke down in price uh, more recently. So we're actually trading, just hit lows down in the 110. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, now for the, for the pound. So the direction of sterling then, in, in contrast to what's happening as described at the Fed, where rates are going to go higher multiple times compared yeah. to stopping at the Bank of England, as you're suggesting. So what does that mean for the parity outlook here? Well, what's interesting, just thinking about the currency space a bit more broadly, and we'll talk about the yen in a minute, but the dollar has obviously been mm. super, super powerfully strong all year. Um, and that's because the Federal Reserve have been aggressively hiking you know, faster than most other banks and are expected to continue to hike for longer than most other banks and therefore this monetary policy divergence is driving dollar appreciation against everything. Um, what's interesting, though, is then when you think about the other side of that, all right, the dollar's strengthening, we get it. But think about the other side of it, and you think about the euro and the pound and the yen, right? And they've all been super weak versus the dollar. Now, when you think about the euro and the yen, well, the ECB have only just started hiking rates. So fine. The monetary policy divergence is huge, okay? Japan aren't even hiking. So that's the absolute maximum divergence, right? But when you think about the pound, you can't say the same thing. You can't tell me, well, there's a massive monetary policy divergence between the Fed and the Bank of England, because there isn't. The, the Bank of England hiked first and are continuing to hike. So there underlies the actual issue for the pound is, is not necessarily the monetary policy divergence, although it's a factor, it's actually just underlying economic outlook being really bad for the UK. And so whilst the, the Bank of England are hiking, the, the pound's dropping anyway, because of that kind of economic situation. So will it, will it hit parity? I said to you, I think, you asked me that, I think, a few weeks ago, and I, I laughed it off um saying don't don't be silly but here we are trading the 110 handle mm. and i don't know now i i still well i i want to still stick to my guns and say i don't think we will get to parity but if, for that view to be right this big move from the uk government has to work quickly and i don't know if it will work quickly these things don't don't happen quickly. So, um, and given the rate height cycle in the US is likely not to finish until February. Yeah. And conditions generally are anticipating to deteriorate in Europe here for the end of this year in Q4. Yeah. If the, if the Bank of England start do a dovish pivot and start talking about that we're at the peak, i.e. we're not going to hike rates anymore, and if they even go further and start to think about into 23 in a recession and starting to think about having to cut, they start talking like that in the next one month, then you may well get parity. But uh, I don't think they will. 
I don't think they'll be brave enough. So I, I, I'm still sitting on my camp, on in the camp where we won't get down to parity dollar against the pound. Okay. I thought you were going to do a Goldman's then and flip flop every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So two more things uh, to, to wrap up on. Japan, as you mentioned, has taken action on their currency directly. Um, it comes as a Japanese currency hit a 24 year low. And we've talked about this for a while. It wasn't really a case of if, but when. I guess the yeah. worrying thing for Japan is the price of dollar yen, which is the most common pairing of currencies that the market looks at. It was trading at 146 when they intervened. It dropped to close to 140. But this morning, we're already back up trading a 143 handle. So we've reversed 50% of the entire intervention in less than 24 hours. <laughs> Big problem, surely. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like, oh, God, it's like, it's like you're st there's like this massive juggernaut coming towards you, right? And that that's the dollar yen moving and trending and the yen weakening and the dollar appreciating and this juggernaut's coming towards you and the, the central bank have just st stepped out in front of it to try and stop it. Except what are they using to try and stop it? Like some, like a toothpick or something, mm. right? The, the, and to put that in numbers, because, well, firstly, how, how do they intervene? Well, they've literally directly intervened. Last time was 1998. So they've literally stepped into the currency market because the Japan have foreign currency reserves. They hold a lot of dollars. Okay. Um, in fact, we think roughly it's about $1 trillion they have, right? And what they've done here is they've taken some of these dollars and they've sold the dollars and they bought yen. So directly acting in the currency market with a monster trade to force the yen to appreciate because of their market impact with this massive trade, okay? But they've got one, they've got about one trillion dollar war chest, so they could just carry on trying to intervene and intervene and intervene. But to put it into context, do you know the value of the um, do you, what's the daily average volume that trades dollar yen spot market? Average daily volume is one point one trillion dollars. Right. So their entire reserve is less than one single day of like volume. That. It's good stuff. So that's your toothpick, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the issue, I guess they're not stupid, though. I mean, they, they, I don't think they genuinely think they, with that single method, can just stop this trend. Mm -hmm. what, what they're trying to do is create uncertainty so their tactic is, right, don't be transparent. Don't say, right, we are going to intervene again on the 10th of October, yeah. and we will sell, you know, $10 billion and we'll buy yen. And it's going to be on the 10th of October, and it's going to be that amount. That, that's not the play. The play is just, just don't tell anyone. So it's like we could do it at any moment, at any time, mm. in whatever volume we like, up to a trillion, right? Which is a lot. So that creates uncertainty. Now, and I think what they're trying to do is force out some of the short positions. There's yeah. obviously a huge amount of open positions in this currency, trend following positions. And I think they're just trying to spook some out. And they're just trying to, maybe maybe they won't halt the trend, but they're, they're going to slow it down, possibly, you could argue, because of that uncertainty they've introduced. Um, and maybe that's enough because they're probably thinking, look, the Fed can't, they can't carry on hiking 75 basis points every time indefinitely. We will reach an end to this Fed hawkish pivot, right? And so they've just, they've just got to get to that moment in time. That moment in time is now a bit further down the track than we had thought. Hmm. But, you know, it's, it's going to come. And that's where the respite will, that, that's the only way this currency market will reverse trend hmm. is when the Fed change direction yeah that's a great great uh stat 
because I think people um, who are not people of markets, they often just think the stock market, the stock market, buying Apple shares and Tesla, that's that's the big market. Yeah. It's a minnow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> compared to the Forex market. Well, there's more money trades through Forex than all other assets combined, mm. like easily more. And look, that's, that is actually because it doesn't, it, if you trade anything, there's often a right. currency transaction ahead of it. If I want to buy Apple shares, mm. well, I'm in the UK with my pounds. Well, Apple shares are denominated in dollars. I have to change my pounds to dollars first, then buy Apple shares. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Well, final thing to wrap up is Credit Suisse. And they've had quite obviously an awful time of it in many different ways of late from scandal to scandal. But one of the big things here that I wanted to ask you was this idea of splitting up is the strategy to lessen dependence on investment banking and pivot towards wealth management a la UBS in the last decade or so who've done that with success. Yeah. So just a little bit more about the the idea behind that strategy from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think the new CEO, uh, I forget his name now. I don't know if you know, but he came in in the summer. Um, and, and his brief from the board of directors was be aggressive, mm. make radical change because we're not doing very well and we're kind of on the wrong path. And so, yeah, this is about as radical as, as you can kind of get it, I would say. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's kind of back to their roots. Um, it, they're much lower risk, lower volatility kind of revenue streams of wealth management, you know, going, going back to their core. And the uh, they're going to sell off their securitized products business, which is actually based in New York, uh, and actually is their most profitable part of the business. Um, that, that kind of brings in about three to four billion revenue a year, I think. So just, gonna... just to, for clarity, what is a securitized product? Oh, well, okay, yeah. It's basically taking loans, packaging them up, mm. and, and selling them. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's, that sounds like uh, awfully reminiscent of... Uh... A bygone it's, era. It's massive. It's massive business, right? Uh, yeah. But it's risky, mm. you know. As we saw in two thousand and eight, um, if you get, yeah, you know, if you get on the wrong side of that, that could be super bad. So they're they're kind of getting rid of that. Um, that does bring issues for their um, tier one capital ratio, but we won't delve into that today. But um, so they're getting rid of that securitized products business. They're going to then set up a like a bad bank put all the toxic stuff and just look let's just get it off our balance sheet let's just stick it over here love that love <laughs> that financial engineering <laughs> and, then, and then pretend it doesn't exist <laughs> and then you you're left with their core which is look let's just get back to the basics you know let's go back to our roots and it's wealth management and i think it makes uh, it makes a lot of sense but but yeah, yeah. and then and Ulrich Kurner, who's the guy right. who's come yeah. in importantly guess where he came from uh the regulators side i don't know he came from ubs ah, having okay. done the transition already he served as a member right. of the group of executive board for 11 years at ubs ah, i did not know that okay and that makes even more sense part of the asset management division right his background um, yeah. so yeah he's a uh, he's he's the man for the job if this is the the direction they want to head in couldn't couldn't really pick a better person, I guess, in that sense. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, look, let's wrap it up there. Um, thanks as always for everyone for listening uh, and for Piers obviously joining me on the on the call. Um, please do check out some of the links in the show notes to our daily newsletter. Uh, feel free to connect with with me and Piers on LinkedIn. Obviously, we're here to serve you, the community. Uh, so, you know, if being connected to us can help you broaden your network then absolutely go for it we'd love to we'd love to help yeah and if you've got any topics or questions that you'd like us to kind of address or cover what's the best way to get to kind of 
put questions to us. Yeah, um, look, um, absolutely happy to have people email me directly. So I regret that. <laughs> yeah, I might regret that, but my email address is a dot chung. So a dot c h e u n g at amplifiedtrading.com. So hit me with any suggestions, any ideas. Actually, reminds me, someone did ask us. They left a comment on our YouTube video saying, "What is our favorite trading film?" Yeah, what it's are a you good question. Go it's you can't, very hard. You can't mention like lots. You just got to pick one. I can't mention lots. I was going to mention lots, but uh... well, maybe maybe give the run through of what the library is, and then well, I was going to mention my top three. Okay, go on. Um, pro and probably in order of so in third place on my list, <clears throat> margin call. Okay. <clears throat> Second place. You've got to be of an age for this one. Uh, Wall Street. If your number one is what I think it is, your top three is exactly not just the same, but the same order as mine. Oh, really? Well, it's probably, yeah. I mean, the best is the best. It's the big short. Oh. Oh, you've gone somewhere oh, else. Big short's on my four. Oh, yeah. Big short is my favorite. Trading places is my favorite. Oh, okay. Trading places sits right at the top. Because not only is about it that an one. absolutely hilarious film, I actually think they do a pretty good job at explaining what it is that they do, these guys. That's on the great, Shaq. I completely forgot about that. But again, we're winding back the years then. This was Eddie I, Murphy peak in oh, the 80s. So good. <laughs> yeah. But you see, yeah, go out there. There's your top four. Go and, go and watch them. Re highly yeah. recommended. Cool. All right. Cheers, Piers. Have a good weekend. See you later.